This week's theme was inspired by the title of my favorite Elton John song, which is Mona Lisa's and Mad Hatter's. You don't have to be familiar with the song to listen to the episodes, but if you haven't, it's one of his most underrated songs in my opinion. Naturally, we'll be starting the week talking about the famous painting and the even more famous smile painted by Leonardo da Vinci. In this episode, we'll be talking about the real-life woman in the painting and why the smile on the painting's subject is so mysterious. I'm your host, Emily Prokop, and this is the story behind the Mona Lisa. But first, a quick message. What is the Potter family? Hey, this is Shane. That's not Shane. That's a robot set by the government. And that's Kenny from I'm now. I'm a that robot I'm, too. From now that I'm older. More like now that I'm robots. This is Gabriel Russo from the Hollywood Scandals of Yesteryear podcast. This is Steve from the Drift and Ramble podcast. This is Nick from the Epic Film Guys podcast. This is Emily from the Story Behind. This is Adam from Everyone Has a Podcast. This is Sean Harrigan from the Cinescape podcast. We are you podcasters coming together in a community to help one another grow so follow us on twitter at potter and family and use the hashtag potter and family in your tweets and retweet other people who do the same potter and family where great podcasts come home as with many episodes of the story behind there are a number of different stories and theories surrounding the origin of the mona lisa you would think from the name itself It was most definitely a woman named Lisa. By the way, the Mona Lisa roughly translates to My Lady Lisa. The most common and probable of the origin stories of the sitter was that it was Lisa Del Giacondo, who was the wife of a wealthy silk merchant. Leonardo da Vinci was commissioned to do the painting most likely before the birth of one of her five children. Scholars seem to have gathered this information from certain aspects of the painting, like how her clothes are a little baggy, and how her hands aren't actually folded in her lap, but gently holding a blanket covering what was probably her baby bump. In 2005, a letter to an acquaintance of da Vinci's from 1503 confirmed he was, in fact, working on a portrait of Del Giacondo. There are theories that the painting could also be of an unnamed courtesan, Princess Isabella of Naples, da Vinci himself, his mother, or his apprentice, Salai, who is said to have been da Vinci's lover. The last one may not even be that far of a stretch when you compare the Mona Lisa to da Vinci's paintings of Salai, and notice the similarities in facial structure. But one thing no one knows about is why the finished painting went with da Vinci to France and not to the Del Giacondo family. It was later bequeathed to Salai after da Vinci's death. Even though da Vinci worked on the painting in the early 1500s, the painting wasn't as well known and loved as it is today. In fact, it wasn't until its theft in 1911 that it became as big of a star as it is now. The painting, by the way, isn't as big as you might think. The oil on wood painting is only 30 by 21 inches, which is much smaller than many assume because of its worldwide fame. And it only weighs 18 pounds, which, for those of you who are aware with my obsession with my rather large cat, weighs less than my tubby tabby. In 1911, the Louvre was the largest building in the world, expanding around 45 acres. With low security in place, it would take 26 hours before anyone even realized the painting had gone missing. It wasn't as overly protected as it is now. In its own temperature-controlled room, protected by bulletproof glass. At the time, it wasn't widely known for being one of the finest examples of Renaissance paintings, and it was hung plainly in a room with dozens of other paintings surrounding it. By the way, if you ever wondered the difference between the words hung and hanged, hanged is only used in reference to hanging people. Portraits are hung, people are hanged. Sorry, personal pet peeve of mine whenever I see them used interchangeably. At that time, there was a black market for art. Stolen pieces were commonly used to trade for money or weapons. However, after it was discovered that the Mona Lisa was stolen, the portrait became too hot to be bartered. The media exploded over it, and people mourned the theft as if a celebrity had died. Kind of reminds you of those people who mourn over a celebrity you didn't even know they liked, right? 
Thousands visited the Louvre to the spot where the Mona Lisa once hung and placed flowers, cards, and notes there as a shrine to the painting. In 1997, the New York Times compared the mourning over Princess Diana's death to that of the theft of the Mona Lisa. The actual heist occurred when the brothers Lancelotti, Vincenzo, and Michele Perugia came to work at the Louvre as handymen and snuck into the museum overnight and in the morning removed the painting from its shadow box and snuck it out. Vincenzo believed the painting deserved to live in Italy, where he and da Vinci were originally from. It was hidden in the false bottom of a wooden trunk belonging to Vincenzo, and police believed him when he told them that he stayed at the museum overnight because he was too drunk to go home. Pablo Picasso, however, was one of those arrested in suspicion of the theft, but quickly released. It wasn't until two years later that Perugia was caught when he tried to sell the painting to an art dealer in Florence. He pled guilty and served eight months in prison. The painting did a brief tour of Florence, Milan, and Rome before finally returning to the Louvre, but it wasn't without conspiracy theories popping up around the heist, including that the theft was a way for the French government to distract from the colonial West African uprisings. And because there's no doing an episode on the Mona Lisa and not mentioning it, conspiracy theories and works of art and fiction still surround the painting, like Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. The Mona Lisa is not only famous for her theft, but also for her enigmatic smile, which most people associate with the painting. Depending on your view, sometimes it seems like she's smiling, other times she's not. This was actually a painting technique many art historians think da Vinci was keen on. An earlier painting of his, called La Bella Principessa, has a similar smile, which uses shading and light to create the optical illusion she is smiling at you when you look at her eyes, or look at it from an angle. But up close, there isn't an actual smile painted. Her smile has even plagued some admirers to the point of bringing her flowers and love notes, and she has her own mailbox at the Louvre. She even drove an artist named Luke Maspero to suicide in 1852. His suicide note, found after he jumped from the fourth floor of a hotel in Paris, read, For years, I have grappled desperately with her smile. I prefer to die. And in 1910, the year before her theft and heightened popularity, one man actually shot himself while looking at her. But not all love art the same way. In 1956, the portrait was attacked twice, once by having acid thrown on her, and again when someone threw a rock at her, damaging the left elbow. Following the attack, she was placed under bulletproof glass, which saved her from an attack in 2009 when a Russian tourist chucked a souvenir mug at her after he was denied French citizenship. And one more thing, if you're looking for Mona Lisa's eyebrows, most art scholars believe they were once part of the painting but has since faded over time, along with her eyelashes. The role of Luke Maspero was played by Fee Vaquito from the Ultra Podcast. Information for this episode was sourced from artnet.com, livescience.com, louvre.fr, smithsonianmag.com, and more links which can be found in the show notes at thestorybehindpodcast.com. Follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Story Behind Pod, or subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you'll never miss an episode. Thanks for listening.